You all know who Bill Mayer is, yes. So I don't know if you remember when Bill Mayer did his house nigger thing. So uh, Senator Ben Sass, who's a Republican senator from Nebraska, and he were talking on a show about Nebraska, and in the midst, Sass responds to Mayor's statement that he has to get back to Nebraska more, and he says, you're welcome, we'd love to have you work in the fields with us. Mayor retorts, work in the fields? Senator, I'm a house nigger. <laughs> he subsequently offered an apology, and he brought in Ice Cube and Michael Eric Dyson to help him clean up his mess. You might also recall an episode involving Stephen Colbert back in 2014, right, where Colbert came under fire for a tweet that was sent out on behalf of the show, The Colbert Report. The tweet in question, uh, quote, I am willing to show at Asian community I care by introducing the Ching Chong Ding Dong Foundation for sensitivity to Orientals or whatever. Sparked a Twitter response from writer and hashtag activist Sui Park. The tweet was a brief recap of a joke Colbert told on the show as a satirical response uh, to Daniel Snyder's creation of a charitable organization for Native Americans while continuing to maintain a racial slur for the same group as the name of his Washington, D.C. Foot NFL football team. Right? So Snyder is the, moves the owner of the team. So one interesting thing about this case is that it is supposed to be satire. Right? So in Colbert's case, the object of ridicule appears to be Dan Snyder's short-sightedness over the use of a slur as his team's name and the absurdity of his proposed charitable foundation as a response to criticism. Now, two types of replies are presented most often in response to instances like the one mentioned above. On one side, there are those who judge the satirical performance as racist. When pressed about why they find it so, the reply usually appeals to its offensiveness. On the other side are those who do not judge the performance as racist, claiming that its status as satire shields it from such charges. These two positions, if taken at face value, seem to represent extreme ends on a conceptual spectrum. The first renders satirical performances racist if they provoke offense whereas the second denies satire, that is, the sort whose surface content presents as racist, can be racist. Surely a more nuanced response can be given. So that's what I'll try to do in this talk. So here's a basic outline for what's going to come. First, I'll sort of ask the question, what are the underlying linguistic mechanisms of satire, and how do they work? Next, I'll say something about um, why I think just looking at the linguistic mechanisms at work is not enough for determining the racial status of a piece of satire. And then finally, I'll end with some concluding thoughts. All right, so the variety of things considered satire suggest why it is difficult to achieve a precise definition of the concept. What exactly is the unifying element that allows us to include the works of classical and modern authors like Menippus, Varro, Horace, Rabelais, Jonathan Swift, contemporary authors like Percival Everett, Ishmael Reed, and Paul Beatty, comedians like Jessica Williams, who appeared on The Daily Show, Bartender Thurston, who is uh, uh, involved with The Onion, and some Samantha Bee, uh, full front of a sentence, Samantha Bee, and John Oliver, uh, as well as TV shows like The Simpsons, The Boondocks, or South Park. All of them at least seem to have a critical edge to them. They set their sights on targets that are supposed to be worthy of ridicule and in some sense may be harmful to the health of the broader society. But that is not enough to demarcate a fine distinction between satirical and non-satirical works. The examples presented above do not share a unity of form that would allow for the enumeration of necessary and sufficient conditions. For instance, there is nothing in the critical feature we've identified that allows us to distinguish an instance of satire from, say, a critical op-ed piece. For present purposes, it might be useful to start with Conal Condren's presentation of two senses of satire, an academic sense and a popular sense. In its academic sense, satire is characterized as a distinct type of canonical imaginative literature. Examples include Jonathan Swift's Gulliver's Travels, Alexander Pope's The Rape of the Lock, 
George Schuyler's Black No More, and Ishmael Reed's Yellow Black, uh, Yellow Back Radio Broke Down. The popular sense of satire is a much broader conception that views it as a mode of mass media entertainment, one in which humor or comedy with quote unquote social content is present or presented. Some examples of satire in this broader popular sense include television shows like The Daily Show, The Boondocks, or phone news sites like The Onion. It is satire in this latter sense that receives much of the attention regarding charges of racism. As such, it is satire in its mass media form that will be the focus of my talk. I find the phrase satire is humor or comedy with social content interesting. Just thinking about it for a moment suggests, first, that humor or the comedic is a central component of satire. And secondly, that it's humor or comedy with a specific content, that is, social content. Incidentally, this definition coheres with what literary critic Northrop Fry says about satire, namely that it consists of two essential aspects. One, wit or humor founded on fantasy or a sense of the grotesque or absurd and two, an object of attack. Siri, tell me, no, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> first, one can make a distinction between humorous and non-humorous satire. Although much satire employs humor, it's not something that is essential to satire. For instance, George Orwell's 1984 is regarded as a satirical novel. But if you find that humorous, let's say you have a very, very dark sense of humor. Uh, many satirical works seem to fall under this rubric, right? So thus, humor is not essential for satire, you might think. But for what follows, I will restrict my attention to the humor set, to humor satire. I do that in part because of an argument that dismisses charges of racism if something is humorous or funny. Okay, second, the social content thing. Presumably, this is meant to signal satire's purpose, that is, that it has a moral purpose. As Condren notes, laughter has been a tool for exposing moral, social, and intellectual failings from classical antiquity into the early modern Western world. Satire must be aimed at an appropriate target that is one deserving of moral opprobrium. Satire that is understood is a genre that incorporates a moral project into its performance. It consists of a satirizer and an object to be satirized. And the satirized object must be one that exhibits stupidity or some other vice. Targeting the wrong object might very well render the performance something other than satire. That at least is the sentiment expressed by James Parker in a New York Times book review article. He writes, broadly speaking, if it strikes upward, outward or inward, it's satire. If it strikes downward, it's bullying. Implicit in the striking downward reference is an appeal to power and social or moral standing. The satirizer, in order to successfully perform a satire, must be in a quote unquote lower position socially or morally than the object being targeted. Also note that the target can be a range of things. It can be a person, a societal norm, or an institution. And if you've been paying attention at all to any of the recent controversies over uh, comedians of late, the whole notion of punching up, punching down has become uh, sort of uh, a buzzword, I guess, in sort of uh, social media discussions on you know, people like Dave Chappelle, Ricky Gervais, and so, up and so forth, right? Where, again, not strictly speaking satire, satirical performances, but nonetheless, there's a way in which you might be able to spin it, right, where you might think of the object of, so especially the most recent Chappelle Netflix special, you might think that the object of his humor in that segment are basically societal norms, social norms around civility and so forth, right? Again, the question of punching up, punching down comes into play. You go, well, he's pressing on or poking on certain kinds of social norms about who is an appropriate or inappropriate target of humor, especially of, of an insulting variety, right? Um, <coughs> excuse me. Again, not strictly speaking satire, 
but there's a sense in which the distinction plays a role in its evaluation, right? It plays a role in evaluating the, the value, the, the appropriateness of its unit. Okay, so if we adopt the sentiment expressed in Parker's remark, then this has implications for a characterization of racial satire. The satirizer must punch up, out, or in, but not down. Recall the Colbert incident mentioned in the previous section in which part of the complaint Park launched against him referred to the use of Asian Americans as a means to carry out the satirical performance. They were not the target, of course, or at least not the intended target. Yet, Asian Americans are a group that arguably have been treated as a subordinate group in relation to the one in which Colbert is a member. How might these factors affect the interpretation and racial status of Colbert's performance? How do such factors affect evaluations of racial satire in general? So, again, I, this is a while ago. So, <laughs> full disclosure, I wrote this, this draft, or part of this draft anyway, was written back in like 2015. And so the Colbert thing was like fresh in my mind at that point. So all, and all the discussion was fresh at that point. <laughs> um, but I recall one of Park's criticisms of the Colbert Show tweet and the, and the routine of the Colbert, the Colbert Show in general was that uh, he was using this character, this, this you know, uh, purposefully racist Asian character, caricature. On, uh, yes, in truth, to mock other attitudes, but it was the sort of instrumental use of that character and sort of washing over what the, what the implications might be for Asian Americans being marginalized in this way, uh, being marshaled in this way as a tool to make fun of something else. Uh, he was criticizing his sort of lack of insight, a lack of oversight with respect to that aspect of the humor, right? So the Asian American, Asian American community need not be the target of his humor, can be an instrumental part in the humor nonetheless come in to be uh, categorized as racist because of its instrumental use, right? All right. So recall that Fry describes satire as militant irony. Irony and sarcasm are considered the main linguistic mechanisms underlying the functioning of satire. In anticipation of one means of resisting charges of racism in satire, we might consider how irony and sarcasm work since it is often the basis of these kinds of claims. One classical definition of irony is the following. Irony is the figure used to convey the opposite of what is said. In irony, the words are not taken in their basic literal sense. So people like the philosophers Deirdre Wilson and Dan Sperber and Kendall Walton think this definition is mistaken. Gricean accounts also have this arc. Philosopher of language Paul Grice thought the ironist deliberately flouts the maxim of truthfulness, thus implicating the opposite of what was literally said. Wilson and Sperber identify various cases that do not cohere with the traditional definition. That is, they think they identify cases of satire, of, of irony, sarcasm, that aren't the literal opposite of what's said. So take the following two sorts of ironical statements. First, the ironical understatement. A single nuclear bomb can ruin your whole day. <laughs> right? Not necessarily the opposite of what's it. And then there are ironical interjections. Ah, Tuscany in May. Uttered by someone who arrives to a cold, rainy Tuscany after being told that there's no place more beautiful in May. Right? Uh, Wilson and Sperber think of verbal irony as a variety of indirect quotations. So take the following sort of statement as an instance of an indirect quotation. He said, I'm not falling for the banana in the tailpipe. Um, so here, the, the person doing the speaking, so I'll just take it from me, me as being the one who's sort of quoting what someone else has said. Right? So I'm indirectly quoting what someone else has said. They think that sarcasm and irony work like this, that basically ironical statements are indirect quotations of something else. So according to them, indirect quotation can be used for two purposes. Reporting and echoing. A report of speech or thought merely gives information about the content of the original, whereas an echoic utterance simultaneously expresses the speaker's attitude towards what was thought or said. For Wilson and Sperber, irony is a variety of echoic utterance 
used to express the speaker's attitude toward the opinion expressed. Echoic utterances in general are used to express a variety of attitudes, some positive, some negative. So consider the conversation between Peter and Mary, two versions of that. Here's the first. Peter says, ah, the old songs are still the best. Mary responds, finally, still the best. You all hear that? All right, so the second one's hard for me to get because I don't, I don't do contempt very well, but I'm going to try it. <laughs> so Peter, ah, the old songs are still the best. Mary, contemptuously, still the best. I don't have the contempt uh, <laughs> personation down yet, but this supposed to be a difference between those two, right? Both of Mary's utterances are echoic. In the first, she expresses an attitude of approval. In the second, an attitude of disapproval. Irony invariably involves the expression of an attitude of disapproval. Quote, the speaker echoes a thought she attributes to someone else while disassociating herself from it with anything from mild ridicule to savage scorn. If we adopt this story of irony, what implications does it have for racial satire? Well, one could try to use it to craft a story about why Colbert's routine wasn't racist, assuming facts about meaning settled the issue. So here's the brief rundown. Colbert was echoing the racism of Dan Snyder and also making manifest his negative attitude toward it. Being against racism is a good thing. So Colbert did a good thing. Since good things and racism can't coexist, Colbert didn't do a racist thing. I think this is pretty much what's behind the it's satire responses by people who came to Colbert's defense, right? But does it work? The facts about meaning settle the issue. That is, if we're able to correctly identify uh, Colbert's bit as a piece of satire, does that automatically settle the issue that it's not racist? One might argue that they do not. That is, that meaning facts do not settle the facts about its racial status. That even if things are clear with respect to meaning, there's more going on. That is, there are also political and ethical considerations that should affect our evaluations. All right? So in order to show that meaning facts do not indeed settle the issue, we'll need a positive view. I have three possible uh, alternative candidates for you. All right, so here's the first. Satire is prima facie racist when it provokes offense in members of subordinated groups. Satire is prima facie racist when it provokes offense in members of subordinated groups. Right? So perhaps there is a prima facie reason to pause when members of the target group are offended. But this can't be the whole story, can it? People get offended for all sorts of things. I came across an example by way of brief poll, how many of you are offended by the word moist? <laughs> <laughs> it's always one. <laughs> so I, I, don't know, so I actually don't know what the story exactly is. I think part of it's phonetic. Like there's something about the sound of it that doesn't sound right. Maybe there are associations with it, I don't know. Um, now, does that mean that moist is an offensive word? I don't think we're willing to say, most of us are willing to say it's all right. <laughs> but if we were going with the view that, well, if enough people were offended by that, and I don't, I don't know, I don't, so I don't know how large a group of people are actually offended by this, <laughs> but it's definitely more than two. <laughs> so we find like some threshold where we say, okay, if 10% of the population were offended by utterances of the word moist, would that now make moist an offensive expression? I wouldn't want to say so, right? Maybe if we reach like 70%, we might have to think about it, right? And there are all sorts of idiosyncratic reasons for finding something offensive, right? So I mean, I'm not offended by if you wear white after Labor Day, but you know, if, that, if that's your deal, then whatever. Um, but at best, we can say that, well, if something provokes offense in a significant amount of people within the targeted group, that at least warrants taking a closer look at what we're laughing at, right? 
Uh, but we still, need some, we still need to go another step to justify calling it racist, it seems. All right, so what about second view then? Racist satire asks one to take up certain racist dispositions that disconnect one's empathy from members of subordinated groups. Read it again. Racist satire asks one to take up certain racist dispositions that disconnect one's empathy from members of subordinated groups. This kind of argument is put forward by Tanya Rodriguez, a, a philosopher who was a John Jay. According to Rodriguez, for at least certain types of ironic racist jokes, the listener is asked to identify with the racist to make the inferences needed to understand the joke. Moreover, racist jokes can be disturbing if we are not certain they are intended in an entirely ironic way. While the ironic joker claims an intention to mock racism, if the joke's message survives the irony, then either the irony has failed or it was, in, it was never intended to reverse the racist message. What's at issue here seems to be ambiguity in the ironic aims. I suppose a racist message survives the irony if after hearing the bit, we're unsure of what we're supposed to do with the racism. But if this is the problem, then we might wonder whether the issue is a failure in execution, one that doesn't settle the meaning facts, and thus does leave the satire open to charges of racism. All right, let's put a pin in that one. The last candidate. Satire is racist when it causes or is likely to cause wrongful harm from members of subordinated groups. Satire is racist when it causes or is likely to cause wrongful harm from members of subordinated groups. We can imagine someone arguing that Colbert's Ching Chong Ding Dong character may likely cause harm to Asians and Asian Americans because some viewers will predictably miss the irony in Colbert's satire and view it as a license to belittle and or abuse them. And this is no good. Right? A similar complaint was raised about a New Yorker cover of Barack and Michelle Obama during the Democratic primaries way back when. Right? So if you recall that cover, it had Obama in Kenyon Garb and Michelle Ruckin and Angela Davis Afro and an AK. Um, and Defender said, well, you know, it's New Yorker. It's irony. We get that. But um, those who took issue with the cover said, well, actually, there will be a lot of people looking on this who aren't familiar with the New Yorker and will take this as literally true. Right? And so it will, it will be taken up as evidence for their, their suspicions that these are radical people who shouldn't be, in, be president and first lady, right? Um, however, one might think some satire can be racist even if it's unlikely if it will cause harm. So for example, suppose a politician, call this person Ronald Stump, was practicing <laughs> satirical one-liners about black people, Mexicans, and women in his bathroom. So he even wrote them down. But being a forgetful person, he forgets to bring the lines with them to a speech he's giving before a crowd of impressionable voters. Say the paper with the one-liners was found later by a cleaning crew, but after the election. So let's say the crew also burned said one-liners because they found them hideous. Presumably no harm's been done. But I suspect many of us would still be willing to call the content racist, regardless of, regardless of its ability to harm or not. In the end, it seems exceedingly difficult to capture something like a principle of racist satire. But given three candidate versions, some of them may capture some of our intuitions about when a piece of satire should count as racist or not. But I also have given reasons that I think should at least cause us to pause for a moment to think, well, we might not track all the instances that we might want to call racist. Right? Maybe the best we can do is suggest that good, uh, good racial satire aims at disrupting or unsettling our comfort with the mundane ways race orders our lives. And when satire does not unambiguously meet that goal, we have reason to question it. Like with all sort of contested terms, their application is really a, a process of negotiation. Uh, so 
I submit here, we just have another instance where we can have no clear, unambiguous, unambiguous standard for determining whether or not a piece of satire is racist or not. But it's something that we should continue debating, something that we should continue negotiating. And as decent people, at the very least, we should think that when some bit of satire is upsetting to a significant number of uh, people, that at least gives us a moment to pause. Thank you.